to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians 4. So we're going to have an opportunity tonight. Uh, we are working through on Wednesday nights through the book of Colossians. We've been doing that all summer. And I think uh, this Wednesday night, if I'm not mistaken, Joey's got Colossians 2. He's going to be working on for us. Uh, so excited to have him uh, bring that message on Wednesday night. Uh, just to give you a little bit of why I selected this text, we are working through Colossians, but we're not going to finish Colossians on Wednesday night. So I'm skipping forward a little bit to Colossians chapter 4. And over the, op- the opportunities that we have as they arise through this fall, we hope to finish the book out. So uh, Jim will finish this out on Wednesday evenings, get us through Colossians 4, 1. And uh, then we'll finish out the book as we have the opportunity. So that's why we're in Colossians 4 tonight. And uh, I'm, I'm really appreciative of how this lined up. One, I appreciate... Uh, Jake bringing us through Colossians as we worshiped. I hope you noticed that as he was bringing us through the text and guiding us through our songs. He was uh, kind of laying a foundation there for us as we worked through the book of Colossians. And I love that when we can tie, and I think you notice this, maybe that Daniel tries to do this. We're trying to tie in the theme of the text, um, bringing us to worship uh, before we come to the Word of God. There's some intentionality behind that, so I hope you're cueing in on that as you worship and, and are led to worship uh, with us on Sunday mornings and as we get a chance to at our other opportunities. But uh, So we're in the book of Colossians, and the subject matter is a subject matter that we have actually spoke about quite a bit recently, and maybe God's really guiding us to some things. This is just the book of Colossians bringing us to it, but it is on the subject of prayer and a subject that we uh, assent to in our spiritual lives often. We should be praying people. We should be Bible-reading people. We should be Bible-teaching and Bible-studying people. And all those things are extremely true. They're very, very true things. We should be uh, Bible studying and, and Bible reading and Bible memorizing and Bible meditating and praying people. And we will be stronger as we are. Uh, but sometimes those areas of our life become uh, subjugated to secondary places. They do not become priorities in our life. In the, just the flow of the Christian life, we can get very busy doing things, whether it be in the church house or in the habits of our spiritual disciplines, and they become kind of puny, kind of weak. They, they become a little inept. They're not uh, as powerful and as prominent in our lives as they should be. So I'm thankful when God's Word brings us to these topics to kind of heighten their priority in our lives so that we can focus on them and we can do a better job at them. And uh, we can receive God's grace to aid us in doing these things in our lives. And Colossians 4 brings us to that topic. So let's read it. We're going to read verses 2 through 6. We're really just going to major on verses 2, 3, and 4 uh, this evening. And maybe verses 5 and 6 will branch out into um, the next time we have the opportunity to work in Colossians 4. But Colossians 4, I'll read to you because it's a unit, verses 2 through 6. Verse 2 says, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest clear as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man." Uh, let's ask God to help us as we look into his word, all right? So let's, let's pray and, and ask God to just illuminate our understanding here and, um, and the priority and bring this into our hearts as we read it and study it tonight. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful that we can open your word. Thank you for being a God who has supplied us with your word. Lord, may it become more of a priority in our lives. May we read it to understand, to obey. Um, guide us in your word even this evening. Lord, thank you for welcoming us into this opportunity of prayer. May we be praying people. Uh, May we grow in our aptitude for prayer. May we grow in our appetite for prayer. Uh, Increase this in our lives that we would be uh, more like you, that we would be more dependent upon you, that we would grow in spiritual fruit in our lives. So thank you for allowing us this access. Thank you for welcoming us into this relationship May we take full advantage of the advantage you've given us in this opportunity of prayer. So guide us this evening in doing so. In Christ's name, amen. So as we work through this text, very simple message tonight, um, just these three verses really. We're going to see a priority that's laid out to us for prayer. Then we're going to see just a narrowed focus that Paul gives us. 
as he was giving it to the church at Colossae, this is very applicable for us. And we're going to kind of see the directive as it's narrowed down for us. And then we're going to practice that just a little bit before we leave. And we're going to participate in praying that way because we have some very pertinent things that we can pray for tonight. So uh, we'll, we'll do that together here uh, this evening. So let's begin at the very beginning of this text where he says, continue with prayer. Uh, the idea here, and, and maybe in your translation, um, I think the NSB has, be devoted to prayer or continue steadfastly in prayer. Devote yourself to this. Be busy praying is the idea here. Uh, so think with me. We're busy people, right? Anybody in here say I'm a busy person? Yes. I think we're all, at some level, busy people. And we're busy doing a lot of things. And um, for me here in, a few, in about a month, and most of you guys do not care about this, and you think, Michael, he always talks about this. He's kind of obsessed with this. Right? But pretty soon, in about a month, I'm going to be busy on Saturdays with charity watching some college football because my team's playing. Right? Uh, so I'm going to be getting into that in about a month. I'm going to busy myself doing that on uh, Saturday. In fact, um, one of the guys, he's actually the president of the college I'm attending right now, he said that Saturdays are for Sabbath, college football. <laughs> was what he said. He's a big Georgia Bulldog fan. He'd do well with uh, Josh. But no, we, we, we busy ourselves with many things, whether it's your sports things you love or it's a hobby you're a part of. Um, maybe it's a home project around your house. I know, Brother Steve, you've got quite the project over there, keeping up with your farm, so you busy yourself with chickens relatively regularly, right? You know, maintenance around the farm and the garden. Um, I'm kind of a house project guy. Uh, so I was busy in myself doing siding for a period of time. There's some here, some in this room that pretty soon are going to be very busy in school, right guys? Here in just a few weeks. Some busy teaching school over here um, in just a few weeks. So we're, we're busying ourselves as people. We stay busy with many, many things. Um, in, in some ways, we stay busy with things that are, you know, not bad things, but, you know, they're not necessarily priority things. I know some in this room love playing video games. You know, I think there could be a measure of, 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 of pulling back from that, but hey, it's not inherently a wrong thing in its right place. Some are busy reading novels and enjoy doing that. Uh, we are very busy people, uh, and we enjoy busying ourselves with many things. A Gallup study I was reading this afternoon um, said that in this idea of just staying busy doing things, said one of the reasons that you and I stay busy doing things is because society has a serious case of FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. It used to be that we had a fear of not having things or that somebody would have something that we did not, so we were busy buying things. We wanted to have it all. Now it's we want to do it all because of social media and these kind of things. We see what everybody else is doing, so we want to make sure that we aren't missing out on any experiences so we can fill our highlight reels on Facebook with all the things that we have done, right? So we have this fear of missing out, so we stay super busy trying to fill those needs in our life. Uh, one thing, and you probably have all noticed this as you've worked with others, and maybe you've even at times experienced this in your own life, when things are a little bit difficult or a little bit tense, we just like to busy ourselves, so we don't have to think about it. Uh, that's one way that sometimes people handle grief, is they just stay super busy, or maybe they ha handle marital problems by just staying super busy so they don't have to sit on the couch and deal with it, right? So we have a serious case of escapism. People like to stay busy. Um, so, you know, th that's certainly true. We have many things that keep us busy in life. Uh, in church, you know, we, we can do a lot of that as well. We stay busy doing many things. We stay busy doing children's ministry work. Miss Bonnie stays busy manning up the nursery, right? Busier than she'd like to be doing that. Um, with uh, charity on Wednesday evenings, keeping this uh, Wednesday night program going. She's about to get busy getting ready for that. Uh, our trail life guys, you know, Tuesdays and Saturdays and Friday nights and Tuesdays and Tuesdays and Tuesdays are very busy, right, keeping up with trail life. And it's, it's a good thing. It's a welcome thing. It's an important thing. We're busy and active in doing it. Um, many in this room, whether in formal or informal ways, stay busy getting involved in individuals' lives, counseling, mentoring, discipling. Uh, but Paul, by the Holy Spirit, tells us very poignantly in this text an area in which we are to be busy that I'm not sure we can say we are as busy as we ought to be. He says here in Colossians 4.2, he says, continue or devote yourself in prayer. Be busy praying. If you took an inventory of your personal life the time you spent last week, could you honestly say that you were busy praying? 
I don't think I could. Yeah, that is uh, certainly something that pricks my heart, right? Busy praying. I mean, even as a church, if we took inventory of our church this summer, could we honestly say that we were busy praying? Perhaps there's something for us, even as a church, as we're admonished by the scriptures in Colossians chapter 4, as he speaks to the church at Colossae, be pre- busy praying. Uh, it is true that we do stay busy doing very important things, but, this, but the text here says, be busy praying. So how could we do that? How do we do that better? Some of this is just very practical things, but uh, certainly scripture points us to this. We should be praying as we go. There's a lot of things that we can do in praying, but it's not all devoted to those mornings of prayer. Those, those should exist, or the times we pull out our prayer list, and I hope you have something like that, that you're regularly praying through. Those disciplines are very good. But I think we can all expand and grow in praying as we go. The wonderful thing about this relationship that God has invited us into, He has welcomed us to a walk with Him, to abide with Him. Part of the restoration that the gospel brings is He brings us into that relationship where we have the opportunity to commune with God. A lot like we think of when we think of the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve walked with God. A part of gospel restoration, salvation, is that we're welcomed into a relationship with God where we can spend time with Him and commune with Him. And our prayer life should be an extension of not just a spiritual discipline as if we're doing some kind of religious practice, checking our box, I prayed this morning for this long through my list. No, no. It's a relationship, and the practice of prayer in a believer's life should be more relational than it is. It should be more relational in my life than it currently is. It is something that we are able to take with us. As we go, pray. As we face the challenge of the day, pray. As we go into a meeting at EB and we know we're going to have a challenge in front of us, pray. As we face a complication on the boat, pray. As we get ready to homeschool our children, pray. As we walk into a classroom, pray. Whenever we face a challenge or whenever we have a moment where we can say, Lord, I love you, Lord, thank you, Lord, help me, Lord, go with me, open my uh, understanding to what is truth in this situation, help me to communicate that truth, help me to show your love to others. God wants that ongoing relationship of prayer with us. So lest we think that prayer must be a moment on the calendar whereby we do this specifically, I think it should be, and more than it is currently in our lives, It is also something we take with us. So when we walk into a VBS classroom as a church, we say, well, we didn't have a prayer meeting this week. Can we not take prayer with us? Can we not live in that? Even in the ministry opportunities we have in our church, we do lots of things. Steve can sit over here playing a cello, and I'm thrilled he does. And he has skills and gifting to do so, but another thing he can bring to the table, and he may very well of this evening, Lord, help me to honor you in the use of this gift you've given me. As Justin walks in to teach in Super Church, a gifted guy who's done this a thousand times over, Lord, help me do this in a way that would honor you. I can bring words, but I need you to make this effective in the lives of others. Uh, Birgit and Micah, and un, unseen by so many, are so faithful, and, and Dave and Joanne and many of you, in this, to cleaning inside of our building. Can you push a vacuum cleaner with your eyes closed? Sh- certainly you can. But is there not an opportunity there in that, Lord, I want to honor you and the action. I want your house to be a place in which it shows that we care. So Lord, use even my effort to be a blessing to the visitors that will walk into this building. Lord, I love you and this is an offering of praise to who you are. Right? We're communing with God in the regular things of our life. We're welcome to do that in prayer. Should we have times that are set aside? Yes, an intentional yes but take prayer with you. Another opportunity we've been given, and Scripture speaks to this, we see so often that this was happening as Jesus walked and led with his disciples, and we know this is something that uh, would have been a major part as they prayed continually in in these houses and these house churches throughout the Roman Empire and the early church. But something we have the opportunity to do, one, because God has given us a community of believers, is to pray with others, to pray together. Uh, I hope you're involved in private prayer. I hope that's something that you do on a regular basis as you commune with God and in specific moments in your day, maybe set aside for prayer, maybe in your commute home from work, whatever it may be. I hope you're involved in private prayer. But let me encourage you, if you're not praying with someone on a regular basis, do so. 
uh, many in this room, and, and I like to do this too, enjoy uh, to go out on occasion or maybe try to set this up where you're doing it at, from time to time with different people and maybe go out on a coffee date. You ladies like to do that a lot or guys liking to get together for, for whatever it may be, you know, axe throwing or, you know, whatever. Sometimes coffee. That tends to be the, the case with me, going out for coffee with somebody. Um, when we do that, that's wonderful. That's awesome. We have the opportunity to talk about uh, the things of God and then just to spend time together. You know, sometimes it's unintentional. It's just organic fellowship. But we're Christians. We're believers. We seek to honor God with our life. And prayer is a major part of what God wants us to do. So lest we forget in those moments that we should be praying with one another. So if you're out on a coffee date, ladies, with someone, then why not end that time or begin that time or stop in the middle of that time to say, how can I pray with you? Hey, why don't we pray together? Increasing in prayer. Being devoted as followers of God to prayer. Actively engaging in it and doing so in the company of one another. This should be a culture in a church that is thriving in a church that is on mission, on a church that's seeking to honor God. Why? Well, as far as church goes, the church was founded on prayer. Flip back with me to Acts chapter 1. Brief. You're familiar with these verses. I just want to hammer down a little bit on the point that this is a priority that Scripture speaks to and emphasizes. Acts chapter 1, we have the post-ascension beginnings of the infant church. Acts 1 verse 11, we see the ascension. They're gazing up into heaven as Jesus ascends into heaven. Verse 12, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem as a Sabbath day journey. So they go back to Jerusalem. And what do they do in verse 13? Then they come in, they go into an upper room now in Jerusalem, uh, with them is Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas the brother of James. All these disciples go into this upper room. What do they do in verse 14? These all continued with one accord in prayer and in supplication. The first thing they do, beginning of this church, Christ has ascended and he's given this great commission and they go back to Jerusalem and they assemble themselves together to enjoy a wonderful meal. To be encouraged by the presence of one another. No, they join together for, perhaps for all of those things, but very intentionally to be involved in praying together. So they pray together. It says not just the men or just the disciples. It's extended to all in that company with the women, with Mary the mother of Jesus, Uh, with the brothers of Jesus, all coming together for the purpose of prayer. They go right immediately before they do anything. They seek the face of God in prayer. They preempt all of their ministry with prayer. And they make this a habit from the very beginning of the church. I think that should be prescriptive for us. It's not just a descriptive account of what happened. This is something that should be characteristic of all of us. Notice what happens in Acts chapter 2. They've been praying, then God begins to work, right? Right? Uh, Pentecost, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place, verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They're filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they're empowered to do the ministry that was active in that day. This sharing the gospel even in tongues unknown to themselves, but known to the masses. I believe that has ceased for today, but ministry has continued. So they pray, they're given the Holy Spirit, or they're empowered by the Holy Spirit, then they go do ministry. And they're fruitful in doing so. And that fruit was, I believe, very much connected to their prayer life, uh, because God empowered them by His Spirit, and then they minister, and they see fruit. In verse 40, um, and they that gladly received his word, I'm oh, sorry, um, verse 41. And they that gladly received his word, so this is the work of the, the, the preaching that goes forth, and Peter and others, and the, this Pentecost event, and it says, and they gladly received his word, were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. A magnificent working of God. Then what do they do? 
They organized their church that has grown from the few who met in the upper room to the thousands now that have come to faith in Jesus Christ. And it says, and they continued steadfastly. The exact same Greek word as Paul uses in, the, in Colossians. They devoted themselves. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine or in teaching. So they're sharing the word of God. In fellowship, it's an important thing. We do great at it around here, which is awesome. I'm really thankful for it. It's certainly encouraging. Um, and it's something that they did and was intentional about. And breaking a bread, which has the idea of this communion opportunity that we were able to do this morning and uh, we do from time to time, maybe can even do more often, but it's a wonderful thing that they were engaged in. And then it ends and we just glaze right past it because it's just that word that's that spiritualized word and in prayers, right? Like, oh, they were great. we got the fellowship down, we got the teaching part, but it ends in and in prayers. It began in prayers and it's now, it's grown their ministry has but the emphasis has not changed, that they would continue in prayer. See, the church was founded on prayer. God's work moves forward on prayer. So go back to Colossians with me. Colossians chapter 4. The church at Colossae was told to be a praying people. As we said, if we take inventory in our life, I think we can honestly say that we need to work in this area. We are not devoted to prayer as we should be. We're not busy praying. This, ex- this idea of praying is extended here. There's some direction given to it. He says here, continue in prayer, be devoted to prayer. And then he says, watch in the same, or be alert. This one translation has a be alert in prayer. That's the idea behind that word there. Be alert. Watchful in the same, watchful in prayer. So two things with that. This idea of being alert in prayer and then offering thanksgiving. One of them is just very practical. Um, and I think very biblical, we see Christ encouraging towards this, is stay awake when you pray, right? You know, sometimes it's like I get my best sleep when I'm praying um, because of just how we are by human nature. We, we fall asleep often when we get into these praying opportunities, and I certainly remember when we think of something like that, watch and pray, find the Peter, James, and John's failure to do so in Matthew 26, um, he says, stay here and pray. Jesus goes, agonizes, prays, sweats drops of blood, comes back to them, and he finds Peter, James, and John sleeping. Couldn't you even watch for an hour? Couldn't you pray for an hour? The spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. So in a very practical way, uh, we do need to plan in our prayer times that we would be alert to what we're doing. Not just staying awake, that's one part of it, but staying mentally engaged in our prayer life. Anybody ever pray just habitually? Yes, anybody ever pray over dinner or meal habitually? Uh, all of us, right? And let's be intentional in our prayer time. Let's, let's, let's pray in such a way that if we have children in our presence, they really think we're praying, right? They really think we're thankful for God's provision in this moment. Like, let's express it in such a way that we're not just uttering a set of words, but we're actually praying, speaking to God. So be alert in your prayer time. Don't be just rogue and routine. Do it in a way that is frequent in your life, but do it in such a way that we are engaged, we're alert in this prayer opportunity. So stay awake, stay engaged as you pray. Be alert. I think it's more than just that, though. Um, as, as you're praying, pray expectantly. Pray that God will answer those prayers. There's a faith element to our prayer life. Sometimes we pray never really truly expecting God will answer those prayers. You're probably reminded of Acts chapter 12, right? And there's uh, disciples praying at uh, John Mark's mother's house in Acts chapter 12. Peter's in prison. They're praying for his release from prison. The angel comes and releases him from prison. He goes and he knocks on the door. They keep on praying. Rhoda comes to the door. Um, a teenager, and she hears the voice of Peter, and like every good teenager, she gets so excited and doesn't even answer the door. She runs away, right? She got distracted. She runs and tells him that Peter's at the door, and they say, you're mad. You're crazy. Peter's not at the door. Peter keeps knocking. They answer the door, and they are amazed that he is there, that God answered his pra- their prayers. Like, there is little faith. Thankfully, God answers prayers uh, even with the littlest amount of faith, which is what we often bring to our prayer life. But we ought to have such faith in God that as we pray, as we pray uh, intentionally, as we pray expectantly, as we pray fully alert to the character of God who delights in hearing and answering prayer, that we are 
with our eyes open to what God is doing as we pray. Lord, I'm asking you for your help. Lord, you answered that. I'm giving you thanks. Uh, there's one gal in the church, she said, and we were sitting in a marriage thing, uh, one of the marriage classes that we had as a church, small group thing. And she said, I try every time when I go to leave with my family, I try to pray with, with the kids in the, that God will give us a parking spot at the busy grocery store. And as she goes, she prays that. Now, often there's a parking spot, but when she finds the parking spot, she gives thanks to, with her kids in the car for God providing that parking spot. And you say, well, that's little and trite, and we don't want to get so little and trite in all of our prayers. I don't know that that's true. I think we can be small and trite, even in our prayers as we bring them before God. Maybe not trite, but small. We don't have to just pray about the cancer diagnosis. We can pray about the very small things. Lord, open this. And we can acknowledge to those around us and to ourselves that everything we do and every blessing we receive is a gift from God. So being alert in prayer also means to be alert to what God is doing, going before us, paving a way of opportunity in front of us. So be alert in your prayer life. Be engaged in that. I've also come to to realize more and more as I've thought about this opportunity of prayer, and there's some in this church, I think we all know John and Donna are tremendous help for us in this idea of prayer, but specifically from Donna, she's dealt with like a lifetime of of long-term illness, is that alertness in prayer is... Um, you know, is more than just the remedy to the problem in which I prayed, right? So as I pray, Lord, will you help? Will you work in this? Sometimes we pray and we're privileged and given the opportunity and should pray, Lord, heal, Lord, fix, Lord, sustain, Lord, bring changes in the life of this missionary's uh, problems or in the life of the one I love, or Lord, this, there's a cancer diagnosis, Lord, remove the cancer. That's how we pray, and that's, we're not wrong to do so. But alertness in prayer is also alertness to what God is doing in the challenges in his sovereignty that he allows in our life. God's not always just trying to remove the challenges to make our lives easier. God, by his sovereignty, has allowed those challenges in our life on purpose. And when we only see God answering prayer when he takes the hard things away, then we miss what God is doing. So alertness in prayer is not just God change my circumstances, make them easier, but God, show me what you intend to accomplish, not in the removal, if you choose not to do so, of the challenge in front of me, but in your presence as you aid me, as I depend upon you, in the battle in front of me. It does begin to change and expand our way of thinking about prayer when we see God at work in the challenges, and then we begin to pray, not just that God would change, but rather that God would show himself. God would reveal himself. God would strengthen us spiritually in the midst of those prayers. So we ought to be alert to pray that God will not just change the circumstances, but that God will show himself mighty in the circumstances of our life. That God would show himself sovereign and good, and that God will work these challenges for his glory and for our spiritual advantage. So watch and pray. Pray in that way. He says, be devoted to this idea of prayer. Be alert as you pray. And then he says, be thankful in prayer. And this may be connected in that, to that previous pr- phrase, watch in prayer um, in the same with thanksgiving. I think there is an element of that thankfulness that even precedes the accomplishment. Lord, I have such faith in you that I'm not only asking you, I'm not only alert to watch, but I'm thanking you before it even comes, right? Lord, you are good. You always accomplish your purposes Lord, I'm praying that you will help me in this area of cancer diagnosis or you will help me in this area of financial challenge or you will help me in this relational opportunity. I don't know how you intend to answer this. Perhaps you will alleviate, perhaps you won't, but I'm giving thanks that you will accomplish good in my life through it. I'm trusting you in faith. I'm wise, wide open to it, but I am thankful that the results will come because I know you are who you say you are. I believe you will bring about this good in my life. So pray and gratitude, and thankfulness. And all through the book of Colossians, and prayer is a major topic in the book of Colossians, the preeminence of Christ, God's ability to transform. All this is part of the book of Colossians, but one key element that continues to be connected, Paul's connecting thankfulness and gratitude for what Christ has done to our prayer life. So we ought to be thankful. We ought to be motivated in gratitude. We ought to be... um, filled with gospel gratitude for what God has done for us, the work he's done on our behalf. 
Jesus, uh, the perfect man, fully God yet fully man, showed us this pattern of praying. I think there's 38 accounts, if I'm not mistaken, um, references to Jesus personally, deliberately praying, or even pulling himself aside most often to go to pray, or being in the presence, as in the Garden of Gethsemane, of, of his disciples praying. He was intentional and deliberate in praying. If Jesus, the God-man, was reliant on prayer, certainly we should be. We should be engaged in prayer. Why do we not pray? I think that's probably a good question to ask. Like, Why is this not something we're devoted to? There could be a very true element of that, that we are just frankly lazy. But I think our laziness sometimes um, reveals that it is not a priority in our life because we have kind of a wrong view about ourselves and about what God's accomplishing, right? Because uh, we would know the necessity, we would run to it with all might if we really saw God and ourselves as fully dependent upon his provision. But we fail to do so because we don't, and we're filled with pride. I think pride is honestly one of the major reasons why we do not pray as we ought to pray, why we are not devoted to prayer, why Michael Foreman is not devoted to prayer, because subconsciously we think we bring a lot to the table. We think, well, we can organize our plans, we can execute our plans, and we can get results. Back in Colossians with me for just a second. Let's just put that thought in contrast to what is revealed about uh, about Christ here. Look in verse 16 of Colossians 1. For by him, Christ, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He is the almighty creator God. Verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He is at headship of creation, and specifically he is the headship of the church. He is the preeminent one. Go to Colossians 2, verse 18. Three, in whom, this being Christ, in him, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All wisdom is bound up in Christ. All knowledge revolves around Christ. He is creator, he is sustainer, he is the source of wisdom and knowledge. How about us in him? What is our spot in him as believers? Verse six, as ye are therefore received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, Rooted and built up in him, you will not be rooted and you will not be built up if you are not in him, right? And established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Down to verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and powers. How foolish of us, though we are so foolish people, to think that in our pride, we do not need Jesus. That we are not fully and utterly dependent upon his supply. Why do we not pray? Why do we not depend upon Christ? Because we, in foolish pride, believe we can handle so many things in our life. Maybe one of the reasons that we fail to pray is because uh, we have the wrong goals in our life, maybe the wrong priorities, even in our faith experience. Maybe our assessment strategy sometimes is wrong about what the priorities ought to be. Think about that in relationship to uh, the things of the church, maybe even the things of this church. All right, let's just kind of get, um, let's get outside of our church context and try to view it. This church, Community Baptist Church, right? We have to be careful in a community that is a wonderful, wonderful community. In fact, I was just in Charleston with some former church members, and I'm hearing them reiterate back to me just how special this place is, right? Just what we have the opportunity to be a part of as a community of believers. But we have to be careful in this church not to equate energy and community with spiritual growth. It may be one element of spiritual growth. I think it is an evidence as we show love of God, as we show love to one another. That's, that's a good thing. That's a good measuring mark. But not everything that we do whereby we feel warm and fuzzy in the presence of one another is completely connected with our growth in Christ Jesus. 
right? Um, we can organize activities and, and we can assess the activity that was done. Man, it brought so much energy. You know how much energy was at that activity? Man, I think people just left feeling really good. Man, I, we, we organized things and we got these small groups happening and, I mean, nobody's left out. Everybody's got an opportunity. And we know that's actually not the case because it's, it's easy for people to be left out even in a church like this and not feel that way. Many of us feel like, man, it's a wonderful community. And I am so very thankful it is. I am, it's like a warm blanket put on every time I walk around you guys <laughs> and every time we're here. In fact, you go to another church and you're like, man, I just wish I was a part of this church because I want to put on my warm, fuzzy blanket of Community Baptist Church because I love the community that's here. And I think we ought to love it. We ought to push into it. We ought to continue to see it grow. But we have to be careful that we don't just assess the things that bring energy and the things that bring us warm and fuzzy community as spiritual growth. What does that mean? That means if we cannot stomach and have no appetite for a prayer service, if we don't like to hear the Bible really taught, we just really want to get to the warm and fuzzy hallway experience when we come here, then we're missing something, aren't we? Like we're assessing perhaps wrongly as a church, as all of us, leadership to, to community here that's here, we have the wrong goals. Good goals, that's part of it. We're to continue steadfastly, be devoted to fellowship. But if we're not devoted to prayer, if we don't have an appetite for Bible study, if we're not growing in these things, then we are actually not spiritually mature. So while that is a strength that we ought to lean into, we ought to not let it be our only barometer of spiritual growth, of spiritual maturity, and we need to lean into those areas that perhaps are our blind spots. Lord, help us to have a growing appetite for prayer in our church. Help us to have a growing appetite for the study of your word in our church. Help us to to be mature in our faith. Grow us in loving community, but grow us in all these other areas as well. And I I don't think they're inept in our church, but there's certainly things that if they could rival our love of one another, we would be more mature for it, right? So I think there's an element here that why do we not enjoy prayer? Perhaps because we don't see it as priority, and maybe it's because at times we have the wrong goals or assessments of what spiritual maturity is. So Lord, show us that and draw us into it. Increase that appetite in our community. Grow us in that as believers. Not in a false way, but in a true appetite and desire for it. Like only God's Spirit can do that. We can put it on. We can say, oh, we're going to have a prayer meeting. We're going to pray for hours. And we can do that and walk out as empty as ever. Uh, We need God to place that in our hearts as we pursue Him. Lord, increase our appetite for this very thing. So we see that. It's a priority. It's a command. So as we transition to our close, how are we to apply that in our lives? He says in verse 3, with all at the same time, praying also for us. All right, so the application here, and we're winding this down. uh, The application here, he's saying, is pray for us. So he's narrowing the focus right now, and he's saying very specifically, would you pray for us that God would open a door of utterance, or he would make clear, open a door for the word, or the mystery of Christ, which is the gospel. He says, the thing which I am labor for, for which I am also in bonds. And he says in verse 4, that I may make it manifest or I may make it clear as I ought to speak, or which is how I ought to speak. So make this thing clear. Make it known. So pray, church at Colossae, for us, Paul, Onesimus, Epaphras, Aristarchus, we find them in this chapter, those missionary band that's with Paul in Rome, pray that we would have an open door to communicate the gospel. Now, we certainly know that the gospel is not just for salvation, The gospel is for our maturity in Christ. So I think there's a fullness to this. Yes, pray that the heathen will respond to the gospel, that they will receive Christ in in evangelistic endeavors. That's at the heart of the gospel proclamation. But even beyond that, pray that the gospel will be known by those who are in Christ when they lean into the grace that God supplies that we would grow in sanctification. So give us the ability, Lord, pray for that. Pray that we will have the ability to be sharing the gospel, that God will open a door for that in our lives. So, how are we to pray? We, are, In this very narrowed aspect, we're to pray for gospel opportunities for our leaders and for our missionaries. In just a minute, we're going to do that. We're going to pray for Pastor John as he's headed up to the wilds this week. We're going to pray very specifically, Lord, open a door for him as he brings the word of God that those folks, these families that are part of this wilds family um, camp, 
that they will see Jesus as beautiful, that they will worship him, that they will see the supply of God's grace on their behalf, that they can be husbands, that they can be wives, that they can be fathers, that they can be uh, mothers, um, that they can be young people that are honoring God and the opportunity of the daily domestic life that they're a part of, that they will honor God in this, that they will be fully dependent upon him. So we're going to pray that. Uh, We also have our missionaries, and we need to be praying for, and specifically the Johnson family. We brought them to you this morning, and uh, when we get to that point, we'll put them up on the screen, but they're in Amari, Japan, so we need to pray that God will open a door of opportunity in front of them that they'll be able to share the gospel. Um, That prayer, this prayer of praying for gospel opportunity is not just for them, Pastor John and those that publicly speak, or for the um, missionaries that go for us to other nations in in the world, but it is also inferred that this is also for us. We need to be praying that God will open doors of gospel opportunity for us. Uh, Prerequisite to ministry, prerequisite to the gospel is prayer. We should seize opportunities to share our faith, but if we haven't blanketed that in prayer, it is God who opens the door. And we've been studying Revelation 3, the church at Philadelphia. A door is open for you, church in Philadelphia, for the sharing of the gospel. Who opens the door? Jesus. Revelation 4, and we see the throne room experience, and Jesus is standing there opening the door to heaven, right? Who opens the door of faith? Jesus. So if we want to be faithful in the proclamation of the gospel, whether it is for salvation or for spiritual growth, as Carmen teaches the Bible and Miss Bonnie here as we're talking about the ladies' Bible study, they're going to be sharing what the Word says. They're going to be breaking down the words. They're going to be pointing one another in that group to Christ. But we have to blanket that if it's going to be effective in prayer. They have to blanket that. Those who attend that have to blanket that. That God will open doors that the ministry of His Word would be effective in the hearts of their Bible study community. Because if it is not, it's vain effort. It is God who opens the door to ministry. So as we go to things this fall, like a Bible, a vacation Bible, not vacation Bible, a Bible Adventure Club, or our small groups, uh, whatever they may be, they will be, we'll be just be spinning our wheels. I like to run on a treadmill, not as much as I should, recently taking up a little bit more, and I stand in about a six foot area, running on a treadmill. Micah, you know a little bit about that, right? You don't get very far, do you? You Look around the room, you might have went two miles or seven miles if you're Micah. I'm not Micah. Um, and you didn't get very far. And sometimes in our Christian faith, man, we are moving, but we aren't getting anywhere. The thing that opens the door to effective ministry, Paul's saying here, is that you would pray. Paul is praying that, this is encouraging to me, he's praying that he will have clarity to share the gospel. If Paul's asking for clarity to share the gospel, I think maybe we should be praying for one another that we would have clarity to share the gospel. We need God's help in this. Uh, So we should be praying for one another. So as we finish this evening, um, let's do that. Why don't we spend just a moment praying that God will open a door, that God will go before